one more thing to do. And we have a laser pointer. And now, uh, last year, um, I was lucky enough to uh, persuade Professor John Peaver to give this lecture because he is uh, an expert on sleep and the control of breathing in sleep. And uh, but today he is uh, tied up with uh, putting together grant applications and so forth. So uh, I have uh, had his permission to take over uh, quite a few of his slides that I can use and I've added a few of my own. So my thanks goes to uh, Professor John Peaver in the Department of Cell and Systems Biology here at U of T. So the central questions that we're going to look at are what happens to breathing during sleep? Uh, we see an altered breathing pattern uh, and that varies with the type of sleep, as we'll see. We see the altered drive to breathe, which is generally depressed, sometimes erratic. Altered respiratory network activity that goes along with that, that is producing those altered breathing patterns and drives. There is reduced chemosensitivity, so the chemoreceptors are reduced. And there is a reduced respiratory motor tone, especially in the airways, which is going to prove to be extremely important that we understand how that works. So what kind of processes mediate these effects? Uh, we have various transmitter systems that affect breathing during the specific sleep states, and we'll take a look at some of those. And what about human health? Well, I think we all realize that uh, sleep dependent changes in breathing uh, are involved in obstructive sleep apnea and a sudden infant death syndrome. We will be taking a look at obstructive sleep apnea. So here is uh, John's version of uh, the diagram that I've drawn from you many times before that we have a respiratory rhythm generator in the medulla and it generates the pattern which alters the motor neurons that control uh, the diaphragm and the intercostals in the rib cage to provide us with our movement of air. Uh, we also have the cranial motor neurons coming out of the hypoglossal and so forth and people are waiting in the lobby and I think somebody will let them in, so right. Um, and these are the resistance motor neurons that control the airway resistance, which turns out to be rather important when we go to sleep. Of course, the ventilation produces our changes that we observed in the partial pressure of oxygen and CO2, as well as hydrogen ion concentration or pH because we ventilate to cope with our metabolism, eliminating our CO2 and uptaking oxygen. We have chemoreception that feeds back. But the big thing is this red outline here that sleep affects this entire system, especially the pattern generator, as we'll see. How about, how do we find out about uh, human experimentation as to what is happening during sleep? And many uh, sleep laboratories have come into hospitals in uh, recent years. Uh, it was, uh, when I first started looking at respiration, it was not there, but it came into play as we realized that it was necessary. I hope everybody has their mic muted, please. And we see that we can measure the electroencephalogram and we notice that it is uh, like this when we are awake, also very similar in uh, REM, uh, rapid eye movement sleep. But in non-REM or quiet sleep, it gets quite different. We see the electrooculogram, which is looking at the uh, movement of the eyes. And we see that, yes, 
Uh, REM is known as the dreaming sleep. And yes, we are moving our eyes around during that time. And uh, we may be vocalizing during that time that we, that we get from these electrodes that uh, we're awake, we have a tonic uh, activity, but that is suppressed uh, when we go into non-REM sleep. But it's still suppressed here, but it breaks through. So there we vocalization. And we can see that, yes, the rib cage and abdomen are moving to provide us with our ventilation, but that is less in non-REM sleep and becomes erratic in REM sleep. We look at heart rate, which again shows a depression, but is quite calm, but erratic in REM. And that goes for blood pressure too, where it is depressed, but becomes erratic uh, as we go into dreaming or REM sleep. Now, we do uh, cycle between these different kinds of sleep all through the night. And that's what this diagram shows, taken from Richard Horner's chapter in respiratory physiology in this book. And these come from a very useful paper if you're going to look at uh, respiratory physiology and motor control, uh, which was done by uh, Thompson, Ackerman, and again, Richard Horner. But during the night, we go through these periodic changes. And so periodically, we will go into REM sleep. And as we approach morning, uh, that REM sleep period becomes longer and longer until finally we are back to being awake. So what happens during these stages? If we were looking at uh, the uh, E, uh, EEG, we'd see mostly theta, theta waves, uh, and then it goes in so you can recognize when you're going in from a theta waves into sleep spindles and K-complex waves, which look more complicated, then into delta waves. These are different frequencies of the waves. And then stage four, uh, you find delta waves, and it's hard to wake up the person, and it may involve dreaming. In REM sleep, uh, the brain waves look quite similar to that in the awake state, but there may be rapid eye movements. There is certainly loss of muscle tone. More about that later. And why should there be loss of muscle tone? And we get muscle twitches sometimes that break through this atonia. And we, we get sexual uh, responses too. And we are easy to wake up when we are in REM sleep. And we find that this is a time of more intensive and vivid dreams. So these uh, um, suggest to you, um, both of these uh, slides tell you that sleep is not a simple matter. It's quite complex in its behavior and alterations to uh, respiration and, and many other things throughout the physiology. We remind ourselves um, again from this chapter by Richard Horner, uh, how we uh, generate our respiratory rhythm and send that message down the spinal cord to the respiratory motor neurons there. And then we have the cranial motor neurons too. So we can look at the tensor palatini uh, muscle and record that, as well as the genioglossus, the tongue, and record that. And we see that that has respiratory activity in it a little bit here as well. Certainly the diaphragm produces the activity that we need um, to move the diaphragm muscle and the external and intercostals show a rhythm as well as the abdominals. And so this reminds you that we have uh, a whole complex uh, neuronal and rhythm generating and uh, distribution system throughout the cord uh, to produce respiration, which may um, be affected by sleep. And here's some rather early experiments from John Oram's lab uh, showing the activity of a sleep sensitive respiratory neurons and where it is and uh, 
what it looks like when we are awake. Yes, you see the nice respiratory rhythm. Uh, when you are drowsy, yes, it seems to be depressed somewhat. And when you're asleep, this neuron actually turns off. And so this uh, is in the ventral respiratory group. Um, although, let's see, does he say, I don't know whether he says that it is definitely a premotor neuron, but it certainly looks like one. And it disappears altogether uh, and stops firing. So we lose uh, parts of the population in the ventral respiratory group. Uh, that's why we lose our drive to the phrenic and then uh, back to wake again to show you that it didn't just die, uh, it came back. And so the, the neuron discharges vigorously in wakefulness, but it actually stops in sleep. So that tells you that uh, this uh, right in the medulla with the rhythm generating area and the areas that send the drive down to the spinal cord, these are affected by sleep. Now, what kind of drives do we get to the respiratory motor neurons? We find that they are converging. Uh, some of them will be tonic, some of them will be postural. Uh, we've mentioned this before, the fact that if you bend over, then the respiratory drive to this entire uh, container uh, for the lungs, uh, uh, our thoracic wall and our diaphragm, will have to have a change in their pattern of activity. And so that will be affected by putting various tonic drives to them from postural and non-respiratory drives too. And so we find that we have not only uh, respiratory rhythm drives, but also tonic drives that come in from various premotor inputs. And there is sometimes presynaptic modulation of these inputs. So it becomes rather complex. This could be feedback from um, muscle afferents, for example, back into the spinal cord to coordinate this uh, movement that we have. And finally, we converge on the motor neuron so that in we put these two together and we find a sum of inputs at the motor neuron. And if we recorded uh, that, we would see that indeed the electromyographic activity of a respiratory muscle certainly shows a tonic component and a definite rhythm respiratory rhythm component too. So that's what's happening at the respiratory motor neuron level. Now, how is sleep controlled? Uh, and these uh, come from, again, Richard Horner's chapter, uh, where we look at the various uh, uh, molecular entities that control uh, our uh, neuronal activity that keep us awake uh, and that put us to sleep. And we can see uh, again our recordings from the tensor palatini and how they change from wake to non-REM to REM sleep, the tongue, the diaphragm, etc. as we've seen before, just to remind you. But we find that the ascending arousal system that is here, acetylcholine, orexine, histamine, dopamine, 5 hydroxy tryptamine, and noradrenaline, they all leave those neurons that contain those and then release those, uh, provide brain arousal to the cortex and keep us awake. The ascending arousal system, however, is inhibited uh, in sleep by GABA, GABA aminobutyric acid containing neurons. They are in the ventrolateral preoptic uh, area neurons, and they have various inhibitory uh, projections shown by the dashed lines there. So here we have a system which will turn off the brain and put it to sleep. Uh, and then allow it to wake up again. And how, how on earth is that controlled uh, regularly so that we have uh, no uh, falling asleep when we don't want to, waking up in the middle of the night when we don't want to? And that can go wrong. How can it go wrong? 
Well, this is from uh, one of John's papers here. You can reference it yourself, uh, dealing with narcolepsy. And this diagram shows some of the circuit mechanisms that controls REM sleep paralysis and cataplexy. So what is that? Narcolepsy is a sleep disorder caused by loss of the erection neurons in the lateral hypothalamus, right? And let's go back a slide. The erection neurons, these are the ones that are keeping us awake. So we've lost those. We don't have such a powerful drive to keep us awake. We have excessive daytime sleepiness and cataplexy. What is cataplexy? Cataplexy, it leaves the affected individual awake, but either fully or partially paralyzed. You may have experienced this if you have been in REM sleep and dreaming and you wake up and for a moment you find that you can't move. That is just momentary, but here it is much more serious. And so they impair the quality of life. And we can look at some of these if you like. Um, I'm not going to go through these, but they're there for your edification to see that there are uh, studies on the circuit mechanisms that control the REM sleep paralysis and, and the cataplexy. And they can go wrong. Um, things that can go wrong, not only with uh, uh, cataplexy can sometimes occur in people when they get too excited all of a sudden uh, they will go and, and fall asleep. Uh, sometimes the uh, process of uh, atonia doesn't work and when you're dreaming uh, you will act out your dream and move. This is why you need to stop that. You need the atonia to stop you moving around, to stop you uh, punching the person that you're sleeping with, etc. And that does happen when it goes wrong. So this is REM sleep that is the really complex uh, entity that uh, has major effects on breathing patterns. The quiet sleep of non-REM sleep, oh, we're, we're quite happy with that. That's quite easy to understand. It's REM sleep that really costs us grief. So on the left is an example of breathing in a healthy human in REM sleep. And we can see that uh, ventilation uh, sometimes is somewhat periodic here. And here's the thoracic and abdominal motions. And here's what's happening as a result of CO2. And it's, it's erratic. We, we get periods where we stop breathing during REM sleep. And what happens then? Well, we, we can't record the CO2, but we can record what's happening to the oxygen saturation. And so during this period of apnea, we see that the saturation falls in arterial blood. And this is a typical breathing pattern during REM sleep. So uh, compared to non-REM sleep, and for that matter, just sitting quietly, breathing during REM is chaotic. And we can see that in this diagram. The respiratory frequency and the amplitude can change quite rapidly. And they do tend to do so during periods of rapid mind movements. And there we can see the examples of them. So it has profound effects on respiratory neurons, much more than non-REM sleep. They don't just stop uh, quietly, uh, they become uh, erratic. So here's non-REM sleep and the activity, the discharge of an inspiratory neuron. And in REM sleep, yes, it is depressed, but it breaks through occasionally and we get fi fiery. And so this REM sleep inspiratory neuron we're recording is sporadically activated as shown, and that doesn't happen in non-REM sleep. So even there, so we, we know that it is affecting uh, the respiratory neurons in the medulla too. 
But how about the chemo reflexes? Well, here's uh, a diagram that uh, John put in that shows that if we are looking at the genioglossus activity, the activity of the tongue, and that becomes uh, important to us later, we'll see. And uh, that tongue activity during wakefulness increases as we breathe a uh, higher and higher concentration of CO2 in the black line here. When we go to quiet sleep, everything is depressed. You notice we've lost, if you like, uh, the wakefulness drive. Um, ventilation would be doing the same kind of thing. Uh, and here in non-REM sleep, we get lesser, less uh, of a response. And in REM sleep, we hardly get any response at all. What um, if we look at somebody else in 1985, Douglas looked at the control of ventilation during sleep, a very old paper, but with the lesson uh, easily seen here, that ventilation uh, in response to a decrease in oxygen saturation, uh, awake, yes, we get a robust response. In non frem sleep at various stages, we see that it is depressed somewhat and it's certainly well depressed in REM sleep. So as we're going through and getting our apneas and therefore our desaturations, our responses in terms of ventilation to correct that uh, are diminished. And we can use um, the graphical diagram that we developed when we uh, studied how uh, breathing is controlled. Uh, we have taken the wakefulness drive away because it's absent, and we would see that the sensitivity to the CO2 is depressed. And we can draw diagrams like this to show that, yes, ventilation has not been depressed very much, but the CO2 rises uh, as you as you depress because we're on the flatter part of the metabolic hyperbola. So if I take this PO2 of 150 uh, and we go to sleep, then the line is going to be further depressed here. Maybe not very much, but you can see there would be um, maybe uh, get a five millimeter rise in PCO2. This is why when you're monitoring patients, you don't look so much at ventilation, you look at the partial pressure of CO2. And I also point out to you that the respiratory chemo reflex change with circadian rhythm. And I haven't shown you any data for that, uh, but anybody that's interested in that can look up this paper and there will be more. Uh, that has uh, relevance to sudden infant death syndrome, for example. Now, here is really the problem. Sleep reduces airway muscle activity. So when we are awake, we have a good airway muscle activity and intercostal activity so that as we ventilate, uh, we not only pull the airway into, and the diaphragm working too, we not only pull the airway into the lungs by reducing our intrapleural pressure, we also uh, dilate the airway. And that also happens not just due to, as we saw, the uh, negative interpleural pressure here, but also the muscular activity. This muscular activity uh, is suppressed in uh, sleep somewhat so that it is not as good as it was. The airway, therefore, don't forget the airway is um, collapsible tubes. And, and so we, we see that we have a narrowing in the airway that will increase the resistance to flow and therefore the work of breathing. And in REM sleep, we find that we can almost shut down the muscles that are like the tongue, the genioglossus and the tensor palatini, et cetera, that are keeping our airway open. Uh, and we may find uh, an, a decrease in diameter and a very great increase in the respiratory resistance, which is going to cause us again to lose ventilation of the lungs. So the consequences of this as we go into REM sleep from awake is increased upper airway resistance, decreased activity to the pump muscles, the intercostals and diaphragm, 
uh, and a decreased lung ventilation that results from that. And the airway narrowing in the sleep potentiates the hypopneas, the lowering of breathing, and uh, and even produces apneas uh, and produces airway obstructions. Uh, and uh, that is going to decrease our ability to ventilate the lungs and maintain uh, our metabolic status. And so here is a figure uh, that shows uh, how the upper airway is depressed in uh, Muscle, in the muscle activity, particularly in the junior glossus in both non-REM and sleep. This is for a rat, but the same suppression occurs in healthy humans. And we can see that uh, um, the junior glossus uh, diaphragm, diaphragm junior glossus, uh, arbitrary units and, and uh, integrated from the, the junior glossus um, activity of the muscle here in microvolts. Here's the, what's happening in the neck, EMG, and the electroencephalogram. Not too much changes to see there, except that it quiets down. It wasn't, it wasn't a very active when we went to REM in this case. But you can see the diaphragm, yes, is depressed down. It's not so great. And here is uh, the uh, genio glossus tonic. Uh, and here's the junior glossus in arbitrary units recorded from the actual activity. And you can see we go into REM where we get this chaotic uh, increases and, and uh, decreases. But in some parts of REM, quiet REM, if you like, uh, is suppressed completely. Same with the neck EMG. And again, this sort of spontaneous chaotic activity going on. So this is the upper airway. The upper airway is so important that we keep it open so that we are able to ventilate. When we look at some of this diagram here, we see that uh, we got the various excitatory and inhibitory and the withdrawal of excitation and the various transmitters used are placed in this diagram uh, very nicely uh, for uh, one to take a look at the details here. So what are the brain regions that do this and what chemicals do they use? We think that airway motor control during sleep has two components, uh, inhibition. So there are inhibitory premotor neurons who increase their activity and release GABA and glycine. They affect the motor neurons that are driving the muscle activity. They, that will produce a decrease. But we also have other neurons that provide a disfacilitation. Uh, these are excitatory premotor neurons um, <clears throat> that are prevented uh, and uh, from they normally release uh, activity um, um, transmitters that uh, will activate the motor neurons, but that release is suppressed. And so we have withdrawn uh, our excitation of these motor neurons. That is known as disfacilitation. And again, muscle activity goes down. We can see this in a recording here. Um, this is the moving average of the uh, 12th nerve activity, the hypoglossal activity, and we see that the nerve is depressed. Um, what are we doing here? We're giving carbacol, it's an acetylcholine receptor agonist, uh, into a specific area of the brain, and that produces uh, REM sleep-like episodes in this, probably a rat or a cat. And uh, the, you can see this because the hippocampus activity, which is being recorded, uh, increases. And we can see that we have uh, um, induce this REM sleep-like episode, and we have a depression of the hypoglossal here. However, if we do try and do the same experiment again, but we put into the hypoglossal neurons and uh, we've antagonized uh, serotonin, 
serotonin and noradrenaline uh, to prevent their excitatory effects. In other words, this is a disfacilitation. We've prevented the uh, depression of activity. Uh, we see no depression at all in this induced REM sleep-like episode by putting in um, uh, Carbacol. And this is from Leszek Kubin's lab, who uh, is uh, somebody to look for as an expert in these kinds of recordings. And here we have uh, the motor neurons, the upper airway motor neurons themselves. Here's the EEG um, and the uh, echolocrogram and EMG in the neck. And we're recording the masseter motor neuron membrane potential. So we've, we've got these recordings to tell us what kind of sleep we're in. And we're in quiet sleep and active sleep and wakefulness. And this is active sleep is REM. Okay, and so we know where, the, where we are there and we see that the membrane potential is hyperpolarized. So the motor neuron definitely is, as we saw in our theoretical uh, diagram earlier, we now provide ab absolute evidence that uh, we have hyperpolarized and depressed this masseter motor neuron, the upper airway muscle motor neuron. Um, but uh, it uh, is in quiet sleep and active sleep has happened again here. Uh, judging by what's happening with these EMG recordings and it too. So we do have evidence that there is actual inhibition. So both inhibition and disfacilitation of these upper airway motor neurons occurs. Uh, what about uh, the inhibition? Can we show evidence for that? Well, here's some here. Um, we have a masseter EMG. Um, and we are able to put in a drug here and we can therefore uh, make this uh, e EMG activity be depressed by uh, preventing its excitation, by inhibiting it. What are our clinical observations that we find uh, if we are recording uh, from a particular person when we go into uh, sleep? Sometimes it's quite regular and we cycle as we did into REM and non-REM and then back down again into non-REM and so forth through the night. But sometimes we find that what has happened is that uh, we have stopped breathing and uh, we then find that the saturation falls, rib cage activity becomes less and less, the abdomen um, is lowered uh, and uh, the sonogram, listening to the sounds of breathing, is turned off heart rate slight decreases and blood pressure slowly begins to rise because these are going to activate the chemoreflexes. And they're also going to activate an arousal system. And so eventually they reach the p potential and cross the threshold and cause an immediate arousal, an immediate waking. The wakefulness drive suddenly returns. We have breathing, we can hear it, we see it activity in the rib cage and abdomen. Uh, we also find that we have been stimulating the carotid body to say, hey, things are getting bad. We're, we're going apneic. CO2 is increasing. PO2 is going down. Do something. And so we have a, also got a burst of activity which uh, turns on the sympathetic, affects the heart and turns cardiac output on, affects blood pressure as well. And this can occur repeatedly. And so we have developed uh, an index of this to find out how many times per hour does this occur. And that relates to uh, how we would uh, um, uh, 
make an index of how bad the sleep apnea is in this subject. So this is the clinical observation that tells us that this patient has OSA. Awake, we have genioglossus activity, the tongue is pulled away, the airway is fine, and when we go to sleep, the genioglossus is uh, lax, uh, drive, uh, stops its activity, the tongue may fall back and uh, occlude the airway, and we have uh, apnea. This reduced airway activity in sleep, therefore, leads to snoring, airflow limitation, the reduction in breathing, and that's obstructive sleep apnea. <coughs> There's reduced muscle activity in sleep. Some people have very heavy tongues. Obesity doesn't help. The weight of the neck, worse with obesity. And of course, it's worse when you lie down um, when you are supine rather than lying on your sides or sitting up. So here's obstructive sleep apnea. The repeated airway obstructions during sleep decrease pulmonary ventilation. They cause hypoxia, hypercapnia, and eventually arousal. So here's the same picture again. And we refer you to uh, a review by Jerry Dempsey and company, the path pathophysiology of sleep, sleep apnea and physiological reviews in 2010. So, this again goes through the same thing. No airflow when you go to sleep. The CO2 level rise, you have apnea, and then you recover from it. And that arousal resumes with a gasp. And you may have actually experienced this if you are drowsy and, and you sort of drift off to sleep and then suddenly jerk awake. This is kind of the same thing that's happening in obstructive sleep apnea patients when they go to sleep, but repeatedly. Now, what happens in the respiratory system in terms of stability? We can look at that in terms of loop gain. And why do we want to do that? Because as uh, Jerry points out in, in this paper here, there, and I quote, there is accumulating evidence to demonstrate that the neuromechanical control of the stability and coordination of motor output to both the respiratory pump muscles, diaphragm, intercostals, and the resistance muscles of the airway, upper airway during sleep is also likely to be a significant player in many types of repetitive sleep apneas. Stability. How stable is this feedback control system? Well, we can look at it. We know, we've seen this diagram before, ventilation controls gas exchange, controls the blood gases, uh, the chemoreflexes, um, then control ventilation. A feedback control system, we know that it is a negative feedback control system. We've talked about that before. But like any uh, feedback control system, if the gain around the loop is too large, we get oscillations, instability. You, I'm sure, have experienced uh, going to somebody's talk, um, not so much these days because we've got better devices, but uh, somebody turns up the volume on the uh, microphone and all of a sudden it just goes into a complete loud screech uh, very annoying until you turn down the gain of the microphone. We can look at the respiratory control system in the same uh, way by saying that we have plant gain. In other words, how powerful is ventilation able to control the PCO2 via gas exchange. We would call that the plant gain. That is uh, what ventilation is operating on. The feedback from what the ventilation is operating on is the chemoreflexes. That's the feedback gain. And so the two of these will provide you with a loop gain and too large an instability results as we see here. Now, 
let's take a look at that more closely. How might the loop gain change in our diagram? Here's our simple diagram uh, during sleep of ventilation versus PCO2 of the respiratory control system. We note that if the CO2 goes too low, we go to apnea. And here is the metabolic hyperbola in blue. Now, that represents uh, the, the way uh, that the ventilation uh, controls the PCO2. And if metabolism decreases so that our control by ventilation controlling the PCO2 changes to this dotted line in a decreased metabolism, uh, what do we see happening? Well, we see our intersection of the chemoreflex response in red uh, changes from this dot down to here. Now, wh what uh, does that do to the plant gain? Obviously, the feedback gain, which is the slope of this line, has not changed. But suppose I am here at this equilibrium point and I increase ventilation by a certain amount. How much reduction in CO2 would I get? OK, you can get the idea there. You'd go down a fair bit. It's fairly powerful. Now, if we are in this position, however, the curve is flattened still further. So if we went up to there, we go way, way down. So this has represents an increase in plant gain. Our ventilation is now much more powerful if we move uh, down to this point here. So a metabolism decrease decreases the plant gain and therefore the loop gain uh, sorry, increases the plant grain, therefore the loop grain increases. And then I've said something like the CO2 reserve decreases. What is the CO2 reserve? Well, Jerry came up with this, uh, along with Eileen Zia and, uh, and various other people, um, in 2004 as a way of thinking about the system without thinking about it the way I've just described. And they're going to say, ah, if you cross this apnea threshold here, you will, you will stop breathing. If CO2 goes down past this threshold, you will stop breathing. Well, how, how far do you have to go to get apnea? If you're here, well, it's this distance. And that is the CO2 reserve definition. But you can see that that reserve decreases as we decrease the metabolism and move to this position here. So that's just another way of looking at loop gain. Now, what other changes might occur? We might have a change in threshold of the chemoreflexes. Well, the sensitivity hasn't changed, but we've now changed our position on the metabolic hyperbola. I've kept the metabolism the same. And so what has happened here, we've moved to a different spot on the hyperbola. Now, let's look again at how powerful is the plant gain. I increase my ventilation, CO2 falls by this much. I increase my ventilation here by the same amount, CO2 will not fall as much because we're moving on to the steeper part of the curve. So plant gain decreases if we decrease the threshold of the chemoreflexes, the apnea threshold. So loop gain actually decreases, uh, but the CO2 reserve is unchanged. So again, uh, the CO2 reserve, in, in my opinion, is, is good for some things, but uh, loop gain and the way of looking at it, especially uh, with threshold decreases, loop gain doesn't tell us enough. Plant gain does decrease, and so leap, loop gain decreases. And that will, of course, stabilize us. What about sensitivity increases? If we sensitize the key reflexes, uh, as we'll see when we talk next week by going to altitude, um, then we find that we've got an increased sensitivity um, and we've also moved down to this part of the uh, metabolic hyperbola.
So plant gain decreases, but feedback gain increases by an awful lot, and it wins. Loop gain increases in that case, and definitely CO2 reserve decreases, as we can see by the movement of the lines here. So that's how changes in the chemoreflexes uh, and, in fact, uh, metabolism, which, as we've mentioned before, changes with circadian rhythm, and certainly changes when you go to sleep, and it changes during the night, during from evening to morning, as we'll see. So how do we find out whether this uh, happens in the chemoreflexes? Are there overnight changes? We can check for that. We know in general that uh, obstructive sleep apnea patients have, have a decreased sensitivity to CO2, but what are the overnight changes that are happening here? Uh, we think that they may be occurring because of the numerous episodes of not only hypoxia and hypercapnia, but also the arousal that are experienced by the OSA patients induce the overnight changes in the chemoreflexes. So Safraz Mohammed took on this project along uh, with the rest of the group here and said, all right, we'll do two modified rebreathing tests hyperoxic for the central and hypoxic for the sum of the two, and therefore we'll know what's happening to peripheral and central chemo receptors. We'll do those on subjects in the evening. We'll give them an overnight assessment for OSA in the sleep lab um, at, um, at the hospital, and then we'll do the same thing in the morning and, and see what happens. So uh, this is the kind of task that he faced. Uh, he had to meet OSA patients. He met 500 of them. Um, they were screened. This was done at St. Mike's Hospital uh, Sleep Laboratory for OSA assessment. He said, would you like to volunteer? Well, out of the 500, 35 did volunteer. We had to make sure that they were non-smokers and medication-free and no history of cardiorespiratory disease, and they weren't obese. They had a BMI index less than 40. That uh, then took these 35 patients. They went in to have the, the experiment done, and we then separated them based upon their apnea hypopnea indices. In other words, how, how often do these episodes occur? And we said, ah, you don't have OSA. Your apnea hypopnea index is less than 10. Uh, some of them were greater than that, uh, but we only looked at the patients which had um, the index greater than 30, and those between the limits were excluded. So what, what ultimately did we find? Uh, the wakefulness drive didn't change from evening to morning in either of the groups. Now, what about metabolism? We can get an index of that by the rate of rise during rebreathing, the rate of rise of CO2. It decreased in both groups from evening to morning. So as the night went on, that will decrease the stability of both groups, as we've seen in our little look before. What about the chemoreflex threshold? Well, it decreased in the non-OSA group, but not in the OSA group. That will increase the stability, and in fact, it may counteract what's happening with metabolism. And the chemoreflex sensitivity, that's, that's really the important one. That increased in, in the OSA group, and that definitely decreases stability from uh, evening to morning. So that may be why these various studies found that apnea severity increases from the beginning to the end of the night. And that was independent of other factors such as the sleep stage. So what is it about these obstructions that might increase the chemoreflex sensitivity uh, overnight? Um, it could be the hypoxic episode, it could be the hypercapnic episode, it could be the arousal. So I thought that would make a great study. Uh, let's ask uh, the CIHR for a grant. 
no, sorry, we won't give you a grant for that. However, um, we still think that this is happening here. Episodic hypoxia, uh, several studies, Jason Matika is a former student of mine, finally it summarized in 2021, uh, the comprehensive review here, that episodic hypoxia does do things to the respiratory chemoreflexes. And uh, my master's student, Q Dip, took on this project, even though we weren't funded at the time, uh, nocturnal episodes of hypoxia. So he said, OK, I'll pick out episodes of hypoxia because in the lab we can make it whether it would be episodes of hyper, hypoxia, hypercapnia or episodes of arousal. But he chose episodes of hypoxia. And we think he thought that that was what caused the overnight increase in chemoreflex sensitivity in OSA patients. So how could we test this hypothesis? Well, let's do repeated episodes of hypoxia that are characteristic of OSA during a night's sleep in healthy subjects. And we'll compare that when they didn't have episodes. So here's the study protocol. Night one, control or hypoxic randomly selected. In the evening, we did uh, hypoxic and hyperoxic rebreathe, and then we did it in the morning, just as Safraz Mohammed did in his OSA patient study. And we had 15 subjects. And then uh, they were outfitted for a full polysomnogram, and the respiratory measures were monitored breath by breath, and we also controlled the hypoxic episodes or not. And depending on whether they'd had them, a week later they came back on the same day of the week. And we did the same thing again, only if they were controlled, they did hypoxic. If they were hypoxic, we did a control study and did the same thing. Well, what happened? Uh, oh, sorry. Before what happened, let's look at this uh, ingenious way that we were able to do it. Um, here we have a coaxial tubing so that we can inspire from this and the valves then will one way valves will allow us uh, to inspire only and then around the uh, inside tube we have the outside tube and outside that we have a one-way valve which allow expiration so we can only inspire this way and expire this way uh, we have a turbine on the inspiratory side to detect ventilation, and we can switch them either between room air or between a reservoir bag which has been filled with 6% oxygen. And we control that with a balloon valve, either via the computer or the operator. Uh, and uh, you'll see why in a moment it has to be a computer or operator. Um, we will put electrodes for a polysomnogram, a uh, limited EEG. Uh, here's, we connect to the, the, the subject, supine here, and we have sampling for oxygen and CO2 analyzers. We do a pulse oximeter in the sleeping subjects. And the hypoxic exposures were for 20 seconds, and we did them 30 times an hour while sleeping which is why we had to monitor to find out when they were sleeping and when they were awake. So only while sleeping did they get the hypoxic episodes. This is what it looks like for the poor subjects. I, I, uh, I must say my, my sympathy is with them. Uh, I can't uh, understand how they were able to sleep properly, but they were. Uh, here's what happens when we have hypoxic episodes. And we can see the hypoxic episodes from the PO2 falling when they were asleep only. A heart rate too with the arousal, notice it going up with the arousals when they woke up. PCO2 didn't change terribly much, but certainly the heart rate and the PO2 did change. Um, this is the uh, ventila ventilation variable here. And this is Oh, I can hardly read that. It's the this is this is the percent saturation in yellow here. 
not a very good slide, my apologies. But you can see from the PO2, this is the hypoxic night. And sleep staging for this, um, we went through and we sleep staged it as well, just to compare between the nights. Uh, here's the, uh, the, the PO2, this is a control night. And we look at the sleep staging for sleep episode night with the PO2 going down. And they did not really come out to be significantly different the way that sleep and awake and the various stages were distributed. So we felt that sleep stage was not going to be a confounding factor. So what did we find? Here's the an example uh, from one subject. Um, of course, I've chosen a very uh, illustrative subject. The hyperoxic test in the evening there in the solid squares. Uh, what what was the result in the morning? Well, this is a control night and you can see nothing really much changed. It's about the same. What about the hypoxic test, which involves now the peripheral chemo reflex, the carotid body? Yes, it's certainly uh, in the evening, it certainly has a higher sensitivity uh, than the central chemo receptors, the hyperoxic test alone. But what happens in the morning? Nothing really much. This is the control night. So we don't see changes there. However, if we now look at the hypoxic night, here's the hyperoxic in the evening in this particular subject. In the morning, it was like this, a great increase in sensitivity. What about the peripheral chemo receptor response? Well, again, in the evening, greater than the central in the dark blue. In the morning, ooh, yes, exaggerated. And you can see changes possibly in thresholds as well. So how did that all sum up? Uh, the wakefulness ventilation uh, didn't change between morning and evening. That's just like uh, the earlier study on the OSA patients. The rise of CO2 decreased on both nights. That's going to decrease the stability on both nights. What about the threshold? Now, the threshold decreased on the control night in the hyperoxic tests. That's going to increase the stability uh, but it did not uh, de uh, uh, change uh, and decrease on the hypoxic night. So that means it's not going to uh, increase stability on the, on the uh, hypoxic night. And the chemoreflex sensitivity increased on the hypoxic episodes nights in the hypoxic tests. That's going to decrease the stability on the hypoxic night itself. So we come up with episode hypoxia and the respiratory chemo reflexes, the overnight changes. Normally, these overnight changes in metabolism with decreased stability uh, are canceled out by the decrease in threshold to keep breathing stable. But episodes of hypoxia during sleep do alter the chemo reflexes to destabilize breathing uh, as the night continues. So it may be that the hypoxic episodes experienced by OSA patients may be responsible for their overnight chemo reflex sensitization and decrease in stability. And in this respect, because these were control subjects, the OSA patients are no different from the normal subjects in this respect as to how the hypoxic episodes work. We will look further into uh, episodic hypoxia next week, um, but uh, we will leave uh, the uh, episodes of hypoxia and their effects uh, here because we've been dealing just with sleep and, and that's the OSA patient aspect. What do we do to treat OSA? And as John puts these pictures here, uh, we have a small closely fitting mouth, uh, mask that fits over and provides a continuous positive airway pressure to inflate the airways and that is known as CPAP. And that is the treatment for OSA at the moment.